Can you feel it? Can you hear it? Yeah, it's the beat. But moreover, it's the rhythm. You and I are called, being called, to get in step, to walk with, think with, live with, in, on, step with God. Can you feel it? Can you hear it? The sound of heaven on earth, God's people. One sound, one heart, one beat, one rhythm. Yeah, come on, crossover, clap your hands if you're excited to be in God's house today. Oh, come on, y'all can do better than that. Come on, stand on your feet. Come on, clap your hands if you're excited to be in God's house on the new year. Guess what? You survived 100% of the crises of 2020. Here you are in 2021, and you're in God's house today. It's a privilege and an honor and a blessing. Come on, if you're in the chat, come on, put some clapping emojis up. Let God know you appreciate him. You thank him for keeping you, keeping your family. I'm looking at many of y'all. You didn't miss a meal last year. God provided for you. You got a new day, a fresh year. Come on, y'all. God deserves this. He deserves the glory. He deserves the honor. Hallelujah. I'm excited to be alive. How about y'all? I'm excited, man. I, I tell you, listen, the new year is a fresh opportunity. Don't sit down yet. We're going to pray together. Uh, why y'all ready to sit down so much? Y'all get ready to sit down for at least 30 minutes. Stand up. Y'all all right? Hallelujah. All the people at home like, I ain't standing up. <laughs> they chilling in their bed or on the couch or something. Y'all get up. Get on the couch and watch church. Amen. No, it's a privilege, y'all. It's a blessing to be able to honor God, and how you start a thing helps set the tone for that thing throughout. And so it's a privilege for us to be in the house of God on the first Sunday, and even for those of you that are tuned in today, worshiping online, live with us, it's a privilege to be able to start the year this way. How many of y'all are excited about what God's going to do in your life this year? Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the awesome, amazing privilege that we have to be in your house, to seek your face, to let you minister to us in a fresh way as we begin this year. In this moment, Holy Spirit, I pray that you be the loudest voice in the room. God, I pray that if someone's heart needs to be prepared, if someone is distracted by other things in this moment that we would discipline ourselves in this moment to give you our undivided attention. Holy Spirit, it is my simple prayer that no one under the sound of my voice will leave this experience the same way they started it. The same power of God that showed up on the day of Pentecost, unleash it now. The same power that got Jesus up out of the grave, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Unleash it now. There are people under the sound of my voice, God, that are dealing with strains and struggles and stresses of life. Let your power break it, the stress. God, let your power loose the addiction stronghold. God, those things that are dead in our lives, that are supposed to be alive, the same power that woke Jesus up out of that grave, bring those things back to life today. Those things, God, that you've been trying to get away from us, God, I declare that every chain be broken in Jesus' name, that there be nothing missing, nothing lacking, and nothing broken. Thank you, God, for signs and wonders and miracles that will happen in our lives this year. God, those things in our lives that we're supposed to be able to see, help us to see it clearly with no fog and no strain. Those things we're supposed to hear, God, help us to hear it, God, without any fog or any other voices distracting us. Father, those things that we've cried about in 2021, God, let those things now become the seeds that have been watered to reap a harvest in our lives. Hallelujah. Father, thank you that your glory is going to be unleashed in our lives in an even greater way. Father, those people, those folks under the sound of my voice who don't know what real joy is, I pray in short order you give them a taste of it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. You may take your seats now. <laughs> y'all are ready to sit down. Maybe that means y'all are ready for the word, amen? 
Well, we're going to be in 1 Kings chapter number 19, 1 Kings chapter number 19 today. And uh, as Pastor Tommy shared, we are kicking off this brand new series called Rhythm. Everybody say Rhythm. I'm going to be in this brand new series for the next few weeks called Rhythm. Brand new series called Rhythm. Raise your hands if you like good music. Raise your hands if you like good music. Most people, most people like good music. Most people like good music. But it takes, it takes a special kind of people to like band music, particularly marching band music. Do we have any former marching band folks in the room today? Raise your hands if you're used to be in the marching band. Oh, that's incredible. That's a whole heap of y'all. I love that. So for those of you that don't know, I used to be in the marching band. I was in the marching band in middle school. I was in the marching band in high school. I was in the marching band in college when I went to Florida State and uh, just had an amazing time. I, I played saxophone. I uh, marched for two years playing saxophone. Uh, I marched for a year playing quints or quads, which are drums, uh, six drums, five drums that are there in front of you. And then my final year, I was drum major. I still got it. Don't sleep on me. <laughs> I still got it. Don't sleep on me. I'm a couple sizes bigger than, than I was, but listen, your boy still got it, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, I still got it. My wife, my wife says, uh, if you follow her on social media, you've seen her talk about this. She says that one of the things that called her to fall in love with me, one day she was at a step show and saw your boy getting it in. She's like, that's my man right there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, don't sleep on me. Don't let the suit fool you. But I, I, I'm, I'm an unapologetic, bona fide nerd and will literally sit for hours and watch marching bands. Something amazing, something magical when you watch a marching band that's in step, when every marching band member is in step doing their thing. Matter of fact, I got some old pictures of me, some, some throwback pictures. I'm going to show y'all some of these pictures so y'all, listen, y'all can't embarrass me if you show these because now I've already shown them, so I've taken the whole thing out of it. Go ahead. And, uh, if you look at some of the red dots or the red uh, arrows on these pictures, uh, that the arrow represents where I was, sitting right there in the front, right there on the side. Uh, I played saxophone and drums. This next picture is actually me in the middle. I was drum major that year, uh, so we were getting ready for a competition. These, these next pictures right here, I showed my sons these the other day, and I think they were looking like, oh, man, I guess we do look like our dad. Yeah? That boy sharp. That boy sharp. That boy sharp. That picture on the left, that picture on the left, uh, we had just won uh, the, the, the National Disney Band Competition, and uh, I had a chance to hang out with Mickey. I had a chance to hang out with Mickey right there. That's, that was really fun. But, but I, I had an amazing time, and I think that there are some incredible life lessons uh, that I want to apply to those band days and those lessons that we learn from the band as we kick off this series about rhythm. Uh, every single member of the band on a piece of paper starts, starts out as a dot. Every single band member in the band, in the marching band, you start out, start out as a dot. Uh, you get these marching charts. So even before you pick your instrument up, you spend hours, <laughs> hours with these pieces of paper. You identify your spot, just like this image right here. You find out what part of the line, you're, I mean, what yard line you're on, what hash you're supposed to be on. Are you on the front hash, the back hash, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Uh, the drum line is always in the middle because the drum line helps to keep the band together based on the beat, based on the rhythm that the drum line is keeping. And so every single dot that you see on there represents a person. And so there's, a, there's four major ideas, four major lessons that I want you to take away from this point about the marching band that I believe applies to our life and applies to us embracing the new year. Write these down. If you have the notes uh, up in the notes app, you want to pull those out because I promise you're going to be taking a lot of notes today. You're going to be tracking with me and, and keeping the notes today. So put that image back up for me uh, really fast, uh, the, uh, the marching band charts. Put the marching band charts back up. So when you look at this, right, um, go to the next one because I think there's two images. So, so the band goes from the first image to this second image, and you've got so many counts, so many measures to get there, so many steps to get there, right? And so there's four things we learn from this. Number one, we learn, know, we learn, we, we learn what to know to do, right? We know what to do based on the big picture. Everybody say the big picture. Number two, we know where to go. We know where to go on the field based upon the big picture, Number three, we know who to be connected to. Uh, a, a flute is not going to necessarily be standing uh, next to a, um, a, clar a clarinet or a clarinet is not going to be standing next to uh, a tuba because you're going to stay next to the people you're supposed to be connected to, right? And then fourth and finally, you know how to respond when something doesn't go right based upon the big picture. Everybody say the big picture. 
So the big picture helps to direct what you do and how you do it and when you do it and who you're connected to. Those four things, the big picture. And that's what I want to spend the balance of our time today talking about in terms of this message is you learn to stay in rhythm with God based upon the big picture. You learn to stay in rhythm with God based upon the big picture. My, my high school band director, I hadn't talked to him in, in uh, literally about 20 years. And so I reached out to him a few weeks ago, and he responded back, and we reconnected. And so I, I, I reached out to him and said, hey, um, I'm getting ready to do a message about the band, and we reminisced and had a good time. And then I just pressed record and uh, let him talk for a minute. So turn your attention to the screen for a minute uh, just for this brief uh, interview that I did with my high school band director. All right, crossover family. Uh, of course, this is Pastor Christopher here, and I have the amazing privilege today, y'all, of introducing you all to my high school band director. And to be clear, to be sure, and I said this to him privately, uh, but I'll say it to you all publicly, uh, I am who I am today as a leader and as a thinker, and even how I process leadership decisions uh, in a huge way because of this man right here. Well, Maybe I don't know which side to the screen he is of you guys, but uh, Mr. Jim Pignato. How are you, Mr. P? I'm good, Christopher. How are you? I'm doing absolutely amazing, y'all. So listen, before I, before I go any further and let him tell you about his, his, uh, his whole bio and all that, that good stuff, he also is an alumnus of the Florida State University and, is, <laughs> and is part I mean, of the reason... You know. <laughs> He's part of the reason why I went to Florida State. So y'all already know how I feel about the Seminoles. But anyway, Mr. P, um, it's so good to see you again, sir. Um, prior to yesterday, man, it's probably been 15, almost 20 years or so since I had a chance to connect with you. Uh, you have just an amazing background and um, just an incredible bio. Um, you served how many years as the marching band director of our high school? I was a marching. I was a band director for thirty years, and twenty three of those at Palatka High School. All right, so thirty years, and then you also um, got involved as the uh, director for our theater program, and uh, directed. I don't know how many plays have you directed now. See now, this is. I just did my sixtieth. Sixty. Yeah, started that, we started that in nineteen eighty nine, and I'm still doing that. Sixty. I'm not band anymore. You wore me out in band. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I've already told the people that uh, introduced the, to the folks that I was uh, actually the band, a band, a drum major. Uh, you selected me as a drum major my senior year of high school. And actually, uh, I tried out my junior year and you told me that I wasn't quite ready and told me to shadow our current previous or at that, at that time, our drum major. And then I had to prove myself for a year in order to kind of win that spot for the, for the senior year. So I, I appreciate uh, all of those leadership lessons. Uh, let me jump to the to the point here. Um, tell me the process. Walk me through the steps of how you would actually take from your head and put on paper designing marching band rhythms. It's it's a pretty complicated process. Obviously, you you, you start with what you know, and that is the kids that you have to work with. You you have to know their their limitations, their abilities. Uh, their desire, their potential, and then you decide what you want to do, like a theme, for example, uh, a theme of uh, The Sound of Music, which is a show we did one time. What was, what was the show your senior year? Uh, I don't remember. Uh, I, we're the drum major. <laughs> I should remember this, but, but I do remember that one year we did Love and Marriage. I remember that one year we did Love and Marriage. Okay, so you take a theme, let's go love and marriage, and you decide where you want to go with that. Where, what's your ultimate goal? Um, and then you figure out what you've got, and then you have to decide what you're going to include in that. Mm. You know, love and marriage, that's broad. That's, that's, so you have to figure out what music you want to include. Uh, as a band, obviously, music is the number one thing. You know, you don't have a, a, a band without music. So, and then you figure out where you want to go with that, what your, what your message is or what your ultimate goal is or, or what you're trying to entertain people with, depending on, you know, exactly what your goal is for that year. Um, then you take each person, say a hundred piece band, which is pretty much what we had around a hundred, usually anywhere from like a hundred to 120 people, something like that. 
and then you give you assign each person a number. If we have a hundred, like Christopher would be number eighteen. I was and, and I, I was my freshman year. I was S eight, and by the time I became a junior, I was S one. Okay, and that has to do with saxophone. Yes. Even though you played in the drum line at one point, I you did. Were still, basically a saxophone player, uh, but oboe for a while as well. Yes. Um, and then you decide uh, you want to keep generally you want to keep like instruments together for strength. Uh, I wouldn't put an S one like you together with a tuba because you need a little support. And it needs to make sense. Mm. So it, everything you do in life should make sense. <laughs> everything you do in band should make some sense. So then you figure out what you're going to do. Then you figure out uh, how many people you've got, what you, where you want to go and what you want it to look like. Now, the days of making pictures, I love that. When I was in the marching chiefs at FSU and when I first started teaching um, high school in 1969, basically bands did pictures. Like we'd make a, a, a rocking horse and it would actually rock. You know, people would form that. And, and a lot of that, kind of, or a boat, and it would go along and smoke would come out of the, the, the smokestack. And we did, but now they've basically gotten past that except some, some bands still do that. Um, Ohio State does that all the time. They did that with the Michael Jackson image. Yes. And Florida State does that. They did a Star Wars show a couple of years ago. And that was like that. Um, so, you know, th your goals and your plans and your and your what you like is different. Everybody's everybody's different. And thank goodness we're all different. I wouldn't want to be like you. You wouldn't want to be like me. You want to you want to be young. OK, I got it. I, I get that. OK, um, so. Then you figure out where you want them to go, but you have to, it has to be a path. If I have S1, Christopher Harris, uh, right here on the 45 yard line, and he's got eight beats to get somewhere, well, I wouldn't take him to the 20 yard line because you can't get there in eight beats. So you have to know what's realistic, uh, what will work, uh, what will make sense, and exactly where you're trying to end up. So you take each person, S1, Christopher Harris, and you, you start him at the 45-yard line, you know you've got 16 beats of music, so how far can you go with that? And you want to make sure he goes the right direction. You know, you talk about rhythm, but there's also a sense of uh, uh, moving somewhere. Uh, so Thank if you, you don't go somewhere that makes sense, then you're not going to reach the goal. Thank you, Jason. And that's what's everything. How about y'all clap your hands for my band director right there, right? So much meat. And what he shared, let me unpack it for the balance of our time together. So we know where to go, we know what to do, we know who to be connected to, and we know who to respond to or how to respond when something doesn't go well based upon the big picture. So here's my question, I'm so glad you asked. What is God's big picture? Because if God wants me to be in rhythm with him, I need to know the big picture. Here it is, number one. God's big, big picture is for his children to be in relationship with him. That's the first thing. God's big picture is for his children to be in relationship with him. Everybody say relationship. Number two, God's big picture is for his children to be in a world as examples of his goodness. That's his representative. Somebody say representatives. God, God, God wants us to be his representatives, whether we are at work, whether we're in the gym, God wants us to be his representatives. When we're encountering people in restaurants, when we're encountering the cashier uh, or, or the, the clerk at the grocery store, God wants us to be his representatives. And, and we've got to get to the place in the body of Christ where we are the ones that set the standard, where we are the ones that set the example. Somebody say amen right there. Number three, God wants his children to invite others into this relationship. Our lifestyle should be so compelling. Our lifestyle should be so good, Purpose, that when other people see what we have, they should want say, hey, I want what they got. They, they should see that. They, they should be so convinced that the God that we serve makes a difference in their life so good that they say, I should not also live my life without him. When we look at this pandemic, when we look at what's going on in the world around us, y'all, listen to me. Please hear me, people of God. We should not be the cynics in our world today. Even the body of Christ, even members of God's people, God's church, have become cynical about our world. 
When we look at the hope that is in the world today, when we look at the challenges that is in the world today, oftentimes you don't know whether a person is a Christian or not because everybody is now cynical about whether we're going to survive. But do y'all realize that we still serve the God of heaven and earth? I mean, I mean, it should be the people of God that goes back and you look at your calendar and you say, January 2020, God kept me. February 2020, God kept me. March 2020, God kept me. April 2020, God kept me. And by the time you get to December, you ought to be having like a praise party because you know that all year long, watch this, even during a pandemic, God kept you. He kept you. He kept you. He kept you and I. I, 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 I was going back over my calendar uh, last week. I was going back over my 2020 calendar, and I had these three days in February. Wife, I don't even know if you remember this. These three days in February, I called her, and I was like, I'm going home to lay down because I don't feel good. And when I started looking, Pastor Tommy, I had chills and the body aches, and I couldn't explain it. And I said to myself, I might have had COVID and didn't know it. And then I got excited, y'all, and I started crying. And I started having a praise party in my own car because I'm like, I had something, didn't know I had it, and God still kept me while I had it. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? It's so easy to see what goes wrong, but God's people have to see where God has been sustaining and keeping, and we set the standard for praise and thanksgiving. And we don't wait until November to have thanksgiving. We have thanksgiving all year long. Excuse me for being excited. Some of, some of y'all should be excited too because there's some other stuff that God has delivered you out of. There's some other stuff that God has kept you through. Some of y'all have gone through some stuff that other people would have had a nervous breakdown through. And when you look at it, you still have your right mind. You still can put your feet flat on the floor and, and smile when you face the day in front of you because God has been keeping and sustaining you. Some of y'all have been on medications that other people have had side effects for, but the medications haven't bothered you not one bit. God has been keeping you. God has been sustaining you. Number four, God's big picture is for his children to live out their purpose in a way that fixes our broken world. So when you look at these four things, relationship, representatives, recommendations, the righteousness of God, that word righteousness means the rightness of God, that where there's injustice, where there is imbalance, where there's evil, when God's children show up, we bring light into dark places. When we are all operating in our gifts, operating in our spiritual gifts, operating in our purpose, well, God, God will then send us, he will insert us into situations to bring his will, his light to those dark places. So the problem becomes, if you are a follower of God and you curse the darkness that God sends you to, you miss the place that God is actually calling you to fix. It's one thing. For a whole bunch of Christians to get together on Sunday, it's another thing when God dispatches us into our arenas and places of influence to actually bring light into dark places. And this pandemic should have challenged all of us in a big way to recognize that you, you are a Christian 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You don't check out or clock out uh, just because you leave God's house. No, you actually clock in when you leave here. You come here to get your marching orders, and then you march those orders out when you leave here. It should no longer be said that Christians are lazy. It should no longer be said that the Christians are, are chronically late to work. It should no longer be said that Christians are a bunch of hypocrites. It should no longer be said that Christians' marriages struggle just like the world's marriages. It should no longer be said that Christians get drunk and, and, and have infidelity and orgies and whatever else, just like the world says. No, down with that. Why? Because righteousness and holiness is still the standard for God's people. And y'all ain't got to say amen. I'm, I'm preaching good right now. Holiness is still right. Holiness is still the standard. And the Holy Spirit was sent to convict us when we're wrong. And so God gives us this big picture. Somebody say big picture. God gives us this big picture to stay in rhythm with him. Please hear me, y'all. Everything God does, he does on a rhythm. Everything God does, he does on a rhythm on a rhythm. When he created the heavens and the earth, he created the heavens and the earth on a rhythm. He did it in six days and then rested on the seventh. 
All of creation, God created on a rhythm. When you look at the water, it, it, it goes in, it comes out on a rhythm. The sun rises in the east and sets in the west on a rhythm. Our human bodies are on a rhythm. Your heart is beating on a rhythm. You are breathing on a rhythm. The synapses in your brain are moving on a rhythm. The blood is flowing through your body on a rhythm. Your eyes are blinking on a rhythm. You can hear me now because there's an inner ear drum in your ear that's responding and vibrating to the sounds of what you're hearing, and it's responding based on a rhythm. <laughs> when God allows for a woman to get pregnant, there's a body in another body, and it operates on a rhythm. When, when, there's, when, there's a, when there's a disequilibrium or an imbalance and the baby is born early, there are challenges because it's got to be on a rhythm. Everything God does, he does on a rhythm. So when you hear that, if God does that in creation, if God does that with the human body, don't you think he does that with your purpose? <laughs> you and I, watch this, y'all. You and I were born in the year that we were born, for the time that we were born, with the gifts that he gave us, with the personality that he gave us, for a reason to come into the rhythm in the earth to fix the issues and challenges that are in the earth at that season. Don't just look at a previous generation and say, I don't know why they did that. I don't know how they responded to that. Their rhythm was for that season. Our rhythm is for this season. When you go read Psalm 78, the Bible says that David served his generation while he was living. And so I want to challenge you, as you get on beat, on rhythm with God this year, don't just think about this year. Think about where God is taking you in five years and ten years. Think about the seeds that God is wanting you to plant right now that are going to have reverberations here in the earth long after you are gone. Because everything God does, he does on a rhythm. And today... This whole series, as we launch this, this whole series, and more particularly today, we're focused on the life of Elijah. Everybody say Elijah. We're focused on the life of Elijah through this whole series, and I would invite you guys in your own time to go read 1 Kings chapter number 16 through 1 Kings chapter number 19. It's just four chapters, three chapters, but it's really powerful because it gives a great context to the life of Elijah. And today we find Elijah in 1 Kings chapter number 19, watch this, where he is out of rhythm with God. And there's some lessons that we learn when we are out of rhythm with God. To be sure, there's some lessons we learn when we are in rhythm. Watch this, and this is in the notes in the app. I want you to see just a couple things that happens in your life when you are in rhythm with God. Watch this. Actually, let me start with this list. Some lists, some things that happen when you are out of rhythm with God. When you're out of rhythm with God, you feel isolated. You're cut off from people, people that you need to be connected to. You feel paranoid. Uh, you, 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 you will believe things or imagine things that may not even be true. You will feel exhausted. That, that is, you literally will, will go to bed tired, sleepy, and exhausted and wake up tired, sleepy, and exhausted. Raise your hands if you've ever been there before. Look at all the hands in the room. We, we know what this means when you're out of rhythm with God. When you're out of rhythm with God, you find yourself in some seasons of your life hiding from your own issues and from some of your own realities, not wanting to face your own music. When you are out of rhythm with God, sometimes you'll find yourself self, having your own self-pity party, feeling like you're the only one out here doing the right thing, trying to do the right thing, trying to make it happen, but God has got you out here by yourself, and you're going through this self-pity party. In other cases, when you're out of with, with God, you can have a Messiah complex as though everybody else is messed up, everybody else is bad, and you're the only one that's good. These are lessons that we learn from the life of Elijah. The last one here is you feel empty. Literally, you have no fresh word from God. You're trying to hear what God is saying, but you can't. You're trying to understand what God is doing, but you can't see it because you're out of rhythm with God. But on the other hand, when you are in rhythm with God, 
When you're irrelevant with God, you, you can walk out your divine assignment. You know why you're here. You know what to say yes to. You know what to say no to. When you're in, in rhythm with God, you can see God providing for you supernaturally. I'm not just talking about providing for your paycheck. I'm talking about where God is canceling debts, where God is giving promotions, where God is causing surprise money to show up, where God is providing uh, incredible, unique opportunities in your life, and not just in terms of finances. Sometimes God will provide for you financially with favor with opportunities from people, doors open that only God can open. When you look and you try to explain how that happened, you don't even know how it happened. God provides supernaturally. When, when you're in rhythm with God, you speak with power and authority. On your job, when you speak, everybody listens. When you, when, you, when you are in rhythm with God, you can boldly celebrate the goodness of God and boldly call out those things that don't line up with God's will and God's word. When you're in rhythm with God, watch this, y'all, you can pray and get results. How many of y'all want that kind of power? Well, you pray and stuff starts shaking and moving. Yeah. When you are in rhythm with God, you, are, have, you have focused productivity. Everything you touch, God is blessing and moving when, when, you, when you are in rhythm with God, you have a peace of mind that surpasses all understanding of man. When you are in rhythm with God, you know that you are in the perfect will of God. And so I want to challenge you, I want to challenge you to get in rhythm with God because it's going to change your entire life. In our text in 1 Kings chapter number 19, I'm going to give you the Cliff Notes version. Because Elijah has just come through a season of success. God has literally used him to make miracles happen in people's life. He encounters this widow. And, in, 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 and when he encounters this widow, this woman says she didn't have anything. She's used her last. And she asked the prophet, she said, I know you're a prophet from God. What is God saying? He goes and forces her or tells her to get some oil. And God supernaturally provides an overabundance of oil for her. Another widow, uh, her son dies. He goes upstairs and, and literally prays for the son. He comes back to life again. In another case, these false prophets are proclaiming that their God is the biggest God and their God can do anything and all of that, and they're making fun at the true and living God. And Elijah, by himself, goes up, goes up on the mountain and says, I'm not going to let you try to embarrass my God like this. He says, you call on your God and see what happens. I'm going to call on my God and see what happens. And while they're, while they're up on the mountain, these 450 false prophets are dancing around these rocks and this fire, and nothing moves and nothing happens. Elijah simply says, God of heaven and earth, if you're real, let it rain. And the Bible says immediately it starts raining, and it had been a drought. They hadn't seen rain for months and days. And immediately when Elijah prays, he sees that it rains. God had allowed Elijah to see a season of success. Please hear me, y'all. This is a major word for some of you. You have to make sure that you keep your focus even more when you're experiencing success than when you're in failure. I hope I just said something to somebody. Everybody wants to pray for the people that are down, and we should. Everybody wants to pray for the people who are struggling, and we should. But we should also be praying for the people who are experiencing success. Because if you're not careful, success can be a distraction. If you're not careful, you can get comfortable in your success and feel like, oh, I've made it now. And absolutely right then, the enemy says, oh, okay, I got them right where I want them now. Be careful. Be careful. Be careful. Keep your guard up. Keep your guard up. Pay attention. The Bible says that the enemy is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So he's coming, lurking, trying to see. Okay, did that success, <laughs> did that success cause you to take your eyes off of God? D did you start saying, look what I did? Did you start saying, look who I called, who made this happen? Or did you refuse to take any of God's credit and God's glory? And you say, where I am, God brought me. What I know, God taught me. What I see, God showed me. If it had not been for the Lord, good God from Zion, if it had not been from the Lord who was on my side, As people of God, we got to know what to do with honor and glory, and it's never meant for us to take it. When, when somebody says, oh, good job, immediately pass it on back to him. 
And so Elijah experiences this season of success. And the very next chapter, by the time we get to chapter number 19, at the time, there's King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, and they are now furious that Elijah has embarrassed the prophets of Baal up on the mountain, and they issue an APB for him. They issue this warrant for his arrest, and they say, literally, Jezebel says, okay, you embarrassed us. I'm going to take your life. Think about this for a moment. See this for a moment. Because in chapter 18, Elijah experiences great success. By the time he gets to chapter 19, he says he is literally on the run for his life, and he literally says, I cursed the day I was born. You got to be careful when people that have success, because if your success is not rooted in God, it will be short-lived. And I want to tell somebody today, as you begin this new year, don't just pray for God to give you a blessing today. Ask for God to change your life for tomorrow. I just said something. I hope you didn't miss it. I, I, I don't want my wife just to like me today. I, I want to think about when we're going to be sitting in rocking chairs in 25 or 30 years. I, I don't just want a, 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 a certificate of appreciation for my job. I want you to see the value that I bring to the job and give me a promotion that's going to literally change the trajectory of my career. God wants to let it literally change our lives, so we have to be, be careful when we experience this success. And so watch what happens. The Bible says that, that the voice of God shows up. Watch this. And he asked Elijah a question. Anytime God asks you a question, it is not a rhetorical question of information. It is a question that should lead to transformation. And God asked Elijah, Elijah, what are you doing here? I'm the same God that allowed that boy to get up from the dead. I'm the same God that provided that oil. I'm the same God that did this. I'm the same God that did that. Why in the world are you over here having a self-pity party and resting on your laurels and not wanting to commit suicide? Why are you here? So as you walk into 2021, I don't know what questions God is asking you, but I promise you, you need to answer him when he asks. And so, Pastor Christopher, what do we do? How do I, how do I stay in rhythm with God? How do I keep the big picture in mind? How do I stay in rhythm with God? Here's four things. Write these down really fast. We've got to go. Number one, listen for the voice of God. Listen for the voice of God. In verses 11 through 13, verses 11 through 13, the Bible says that, that God comes or Elijah looks for God in the wind. He's not in the wind. That, God, that Elijah looks for God in the earthquake. He's not in the earthquake. That Elijah looks for God in the fire. He's not in the fire. And then God shows up in a still, small voice. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to challenge you today in this moment. Please hear me. This is not spooky. This is real life for a Christian. Please develop the ears to hear the voice of God. Please, y'all, I'm begging you. I'm, I'm, I'm on my hands and my knees. I'm begging you. Please develop ears to hear the voice of God. The Bible says that my sheep hear my voice. Watch this. Important part. And the voice of a stranger, they will not follow. We've got too many people who are Christians who can't hear the voice of God. There's too many other voices in your life sometimes. Learn how to hear the voice of God. There's this new app that, that came out a couple months ago. It's been taken off. It's called, it's called uh, Clubhouse. It's called Clubhouse. It's been taken off. About a million people have already downloaded the app, Pastor Tommy. About a million people. Me and Pastor Tommy, I know y'all follow us. About a million people. About a million people. If you're on Android, I wasn't talking to you. It's not open to Android users yet. I love y'all, but y'all got to be delivered. No, I'm just kidding. 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 Now, I'm, I'm not kidding about it not being open to y'all. They haven't, they haven't opened it to Android users yet. So y'all y'all just watch from afar until they, they open it. <laughs> but, but here, here's, here's the point I'm making. Here's the point I'm making. Here's the point. Come back, come back, come back, come back, come back. On this app, they got these rooms that you go in to listen to these conversations. And when you listen, when you read the title of the room, it will make you think, oh, this is a Christian room. Oh, this is a Christian Bible study. Oh, this is being led by prophet this. And oh, this is being led by bishop this. And, oh, this is led by pastor that. So you go in the room and you listen. And if you have ears to hear the voice of God, you're like, peace, I'm out. 
Because everything that attaches its name to God doesn't mean that it's God. Please hear me, y'all. The Bible says that in the last days, even the very elect of God will be fooled. How? Watch this. Salt and sugar taste the same or look the same. Salt and sugar, they look the same until you experience it. Then you can tell the difference between the two. And I want to challenge you, learn to hear the voice of God by experiencing God so that you can recognize when it's not him. Number two, number two, number two, number two. Look for the hand of God. Look for the hand of God. When the Bible talks about the hand of God, it suggests a thing that has God's approval or his disapproval. It suggests his care, his support, and his help. The other day we were in the store, and I was walking with my, my, my youngest, Crystal, two. She's two. Uh, Y'all pray for her. She's going on 20. She was two. So we're walking through the store, and she reaches her hand up for me. She reaches her hand up for me. And, and in that moment, Pastor Carminia, I recognized in that moment that it was, a, it was a lot of tall people. It was a lot of tall stuff. And she didn't want to get lost and disconnected from her daddy. So she reached for her daddy's hand because there was a lot of stuff going on around her and she didn't want to get lost. She didn't want nothing to happen to her. And maybe some of those things were making her scared. So she reached for her daddy's hand. I'm trying to help somebody. When you are in moments of your life where you're lost, where you're confused, where there's stuff that's hitting you, reach for your daddy's hand because his hand signifies his presence. Oh, I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen. Number three, number three, I got to go. Number three, look for the work of God. 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 Please hear me, y'all. This is really important. This is really important. Almost every miracle that Jesus performs in Scripture, he invites a person to participate in their healing. This is going to sound harsh. This is going to sound terse. This is going to sound rough, but I got to give it to you the way I wrote it. There are many Christians in the body of Christ today who are praying for God to open a door, and God hasn't opened it. Watch this. Please hear me. I say this out of love because the Christian is lazy. Because the Christian has not shifted gears and made up in their mind that God gets first place. The greatest challenge for us today in the body of Christ is to learn how to represent him when we leave here. And that involves working for him. That involves representing him when we leave here. Here's the last thing. Number one, look, listen for the voice of God. Number two, look for the hand of God. Number three, look for the work of God. Let me, let me say this really fast. If you're going to be busy, be busy for God. If you're going to have goals, make sure God is a priority. If you're going to have a calendar, make sure God is on the calendar. Number four, look for the people of God. Look for the people of God. At the end of every year, there are these, thought, these thoughts that go around where well, you know it's the end of the year. Before you go into the new year, you need to find out who you need to cut off. You don't want to take old baggage into the new year, so cut these people out of your life. And, and here's my problem with that. Here's my problem. I got two problems. I got a bunch, but I got two I'm going to tell you about. Number, the first one is, if you got to always keep cutting people off, the people ain't the problem. Number two, please hear this. Number two, when God gets ready to move you to a new season, when God gets ready to send a blessing into your life, he sends it through people. And many of us have kept too many people at a distance and have literally cut off the blessings that God is trying to get to us because we don't see the people as the blessing carrier. So, in this new season, this new year, ask God to give you the eyes to see the people he's sending to be a blessing to you. Final story, I'm going to tell you, and I'm done. Pastor Tommy, you can come on, we can close out. I was at this conference. I was at this conference, and uh, I was getting ready to walk up. 6,000 people at the conference. I was getting ready to walk up to receive the offering at this conference. Ms. Trina, I was getting ready to go up. 6,000 people at this conference. 6,000. I was getting ready to receive the offering at this conference. And there was this pastor, this bishop. We're good friends. He said this, what I'm going to tell you, he said this to me in love. 
This is my story. I'm not talking about you. This is my story. He said this to me in love. Bishop Oscar Brown from Baltimore. He had just, he had just walked off the steps, did what he did on the stage. I'm going to walk up on the stage, 6,000 people. As I'm walking up the steps, he whispers in my ear, you need to lose weight. Can I be honest with y'all? I was mad. First of all, I'm like, yo, man, you couldn't have waited to tell me this. I'm going to walk up 6,000 people in the audience, and I got to receive this offering. You couldn't have waited. For three days, I was mad at him. On the third day, I woke up to get ready to do my time of devotion. And I was stealing my feelings, stealing my feelings. He got the nerve to tell me I need to lose weight. Who he think he is? Right? At that time, I was a little bit over 300 pounds. And the Holy Spirit said to me, Sierra, he said, receive it. The Holy Spirit said to me, receive it. I was mad at the Holy Spirit. I'm like, what in the world? But in that moment, God sent him to probably save my life, to improve the quality of my life. I, I, I still got some work to do. Don't look at me like that. I still got some work to do. But I'm on my way. What's my point? God sends people to help improve the quality of your life. So here's how we're going to end this today. Everybody's going to anoint themselves. But we've got a special way that we're going to do it. Pastor Tom is going to come and explain that. And then we're going to leave. We're going to go home getting in rhythm with God. Amen? Amen. Let's give it up for the word today. I want you guys to stand with me around the room. Stand with me in your room as well. And we're going to do something a little different to end off the year. We're going to anoint ourselves. And so first impressions, they're going to come around and they're just going to give you like a little drop of oil in your hand. If you want to do this, you can. You don't have to. But if you want to do this, I want to invite you to do this. If you're at home, I mean, you can go find some like olive oil or Crisco or something real quick in the, in the kitchen. But, but let, let me tell you really quick as we get ready to do this, what's the significance of anointing? There's a lot of purposes as we look at scripture and we see, I mean, in Jewish history, a lot of it was hospitality. When somebody came to your house, they might just anoint you as you came in the door as a, as a form of hospitality. Um, when, when someone stepped into a new position, a king, a leader, a pastor, they would get anointed. You know, last month, two months ago, uh, we anointed Pastor Darnell as he was ordained and became a pastor here at Crossover Church. It's another time when we see people get anointed. We see in the scripture when people are sick, the leaders of the church can pray over them. They, they get anointed. We see Jesus, even in the book of Isaiah, we studied Isaiah during the month of December. Jesus was called the anointed one. Me and my wife talked about that last Sunday from our house to your house. In the New Testament, it talks about that as well. Jesus says, I'm the anointed one, right? And so when you have a relationship with the anointed one, you have the Holy Spirit. So you are anointed. So you don't have to do this today, right? Because if you have a relationship with Jesus, you're already anointed. But you know what? Um, we get to. We get to as a symbol to remind us as we're stepping into this new year. Another thing we see about anointing is when people would literally go into battle sometimes they would actually anoint them. So they, they would come up and say, Dennis, let, let me see your sword and your shield. We're going to put some anointing oil on that as you're getting ready to go into battle. Well, guess what? Let me, let me be the first one to tell you guys. 2021 is here, and you're getting ready to go into battle. I know on the first Sunday of the year, we're like, oh, man, 2021 is going to be the year of my blessing. It's going to be my breakthrough. And I pray that there will be a lot of that. But let me guarantee you along with that, there's going to be some battling. So as you get sent out from this house and from your house on this first Sunday of the year to anoint ourselves, to remind us we're going into spiritual battle to pray that God will protect your heart and your mind and you'll be in rhythm with him. So if you go ahead and just take that little drop of oil that, that's in your hand and just go ahead and just put it on your forehead. Let me pray for you. Father, I pray for my church family today, my brothers and sisters in Christ, in the room and in their rooms all over the place, God. And God, as we anoint ourselves right now, we're just representing, God, 
for those of us that have a relationship with you that you've already sealed us. But we're reminding ourselves symbolically that we're going into battle. Every day is a spiritual battle. The scripture says that we're supposed to die to ourselves daily. It's a battle. It can be a struggle. So God, I pray you'll protect the hearts and the minds of my church family, that you'll use us, that you'll get us ready for whatever 2020 has in store. We don't know what it holds, but we know the one that holds it all. So we're good because you've got us and we can be confident as we step into this new season, God. So I pray you'll just bless your people today, God, and use us even this week. In Jesus' name, everyone said. Amen. Come on, give it up for the Lord one last time. First Sunday of 2021. We want to send you guys out with a blessing today like we always do. This is our declaration, our mission statement. We're going to read it together on the count of three. Y'all ready? Y'all ready? All right, ready? One, two, three. Our mission is to empower people to discover, develop, and display Jesus Christ in every area of our lives. Listen, if you want to...